Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to such a distinguished audience today uh, about this problem, which uh, we've been working on under uh, Professor Berliant, along with our collaborators, Lei Zheng and uh, Vladimir Rebolko. And what we are studying here is a model of cell motility, specifically crawling cell motility, which is, of course, a different flavor of the type of uh, problems we've been seeing so far this week. But as you'll see, uh, in fact, Ginsburg-Landau plays a crucial role uh, in this model. So in order to motivate properly uh, the model that we'll be using in the uh, analysis, I first need to begin by explaining to everyone the basics of the biology and the physics of how a, a cell crawls. And uh, this will help us motivate the actual phase field model, which was used in order to model cell motility in a very effective and efficient way. Uh, from there, I'll explain, uh, and, and this I will explain uh, in comparison to a classical model called the Allen Kahn phase field model, which uh, some people here, of course, are quite familiar with. Uh, next, I'll move into the uh, interphase limit, in which uh, we consider the phase field model where the interface parameter tends to zero, and we have an interface equation. And finally, I'll uh, hopefully have some time to show you some numerical investigations at the end and we can see some of the interesting behavior which arises in contrast with, for example, the Allen Kahn equation, where we understand that a very careful balance of physical parameters can give rise to very non trivial and very interesting results. So, first, uh, what we'll be studying in this presentation is specifically something called a keratocyte cell. This is a cell that does exist in our bodies in the cornea, in your eye. Uh, but we'll be studying a fish keratocyte. This is the typical model organism in experiments conducted by biologists. Uh, and these cells move by propagating along a substrate, uh, the epithelial layer, which is like a skin layer, uh, a skin cell. And these move by crawling along this substrate uh, in the following way. So as you can see, they move in essentially straight lines. It turns out they propagate for many times their own cell length making them perf perfect model organisms for this type of mathematical analysis. And uh, it's also relevant to note that they maintain their cell shape, again, making them very perfect candidates for us to model as a first approximation for understanding how cells move. Okay. Of course, it's very important to recognize that by varying various physical parameters, we, of course, can give rise to very uh, interesting uh, atypical behavior, such as uh, breathing of the cell and ruffling of the inter interface and uh, different adhesion strengths give rise to various uh, shapes of the cell which no longer are consistent with our previous uh, movie. So certainly a wealth of problems can be asked and answered in this regime. Okay. So the actual uh, physics that are going into this model, so here's our uh, cartoon of the actual cell. Uh, in this picture we're working in the plane of the blackboard and the cell wants to move up. And so the up is the front forward direction. What happens is due to, for example, chemotaxis, there's a chemical gradient, which causes the cell to choose a preferred direction of movement. Uh, and once you know, a very serious and very complicated uh, series of um, biopathways take place, we begin to propagate the cell in the forward direction. In the front of the cell, uh, we have a globular, like a, a round protein called actin which forms filaments by building on top of each other. This is a process called actin polymerization. Uh, these filaments then form very rigid structures, a very rigid array at the front of the cell, as you can see here, and creates a sort of treadmill effect in which, due to the biology of the system, the filaments will tend to build on the front of, on the front of this array and release from the back, okay, creating a, exactly a treadmill effect. Uh, this forward motion pushes the membrane of the cell and thanks to the adhesion to the substrate, this creates a forward motion. Okay. Of course, this isn't sufficient. Right? There are many other uh, interacting forces which also contribute in very significant ways. For example, just to give you an idea, there's another protein called myosin, which uh, interacts with loose actin filaments at the back of the cell. And essentially, they interact at the back of the cell, creating contractile forces. And these help drag the, for, uh, drag the back of the cell forward so as to ma help maintain shape. Finally, of course, uh, in, a, in this membrane of the cell, we have 
surface tension forces which contribute to the volume preservation as well as overall cell shape. Okay. And these are just a few of the forces going into the overall mechanism. There are many complex biopathways which take place. And I really want to stress that uh, biologists still don't fully understand how these cells move. I mean, this is a very complicated thing. And so, in some sense, this motivates very well the need for mathematicians to attempt to model these sorts of cell movements to have a better intuition for what are the major contributing forces. So the model that we'll be start, we're starting with is a model that was proposed a few years ago by Siebert, Swamnathan, and Aronson. Uh, and this is a phase field model. In, uh, fa the way the phase field model works is we have a phase field variable, rho, uh, which in some sense you can think of as analogous to an order parameter, as we've been seeing this week. And so rho will take a value of 1 on the interior of the cell and value 0 outside of the cell. However, we don't have a sharp interface in this case, but rather we have an epsilon width transition. So this line is actually an epsilon transition over which we have a smooth uh, change of rho going from 1 to 0. So we're having a smooth interface transition. We couple this with a vector field P, and P is going to represent the uh, actin orientation inside the cell. So this will help us mimic the internal forces, which are the internal mechanisms which cause a forward force. So the actual equation, which we start with, is given by these coupled equations. So as you can see, the first thing we start with is rho, uh, the, the rho's evolution, which is given by, perhaps if you recognize this first part as the allen kahn part of this equation. Here, w is an equal double well potential, given by uh, 1 fourth rho squared times 1 minus rho squared. And I really want to draw your attention, however, to the terms in red here, uh, where we see that the way these uh, equations are coupled, right, the, the, the uh, phase field uh, parameter along with the actin polymerization uh, vector field P, they're coupled in the gradient terms, which is uh, sort of a non-trivial coupling uh, between these equations. And finally, uh, lambda epsilon here is given uh, by this non-local term, which uh, enforces volume preservation in the model. Okay, again, this is a very physical uh, phenomenon, so we enforce this to make sure that the model is accurate. So our goal then is to understand the interface limit, if we can recapture the interface dynamics, if we take this epsilon parameter back to zero. Okay? So we get rid of this smooth transition width. So because of this gradient coupling and non-local mass preservation, it turns out that very classical methods to solve these types of problems, such as gradient flows and uh, sort of for gamma convergence, as well as uh, maximum comparison principles are no longer uh, valid for this model. Okay, so novel techniques were needed. Uh, and in fact, in a recent work of Professor Berland uh, and his collaborators, uh, they actually uh, did compute this interface limit. And um, the equation which they derived is shown here in equation two. So here, V is the normal velocity. And it's given by kappa, which is the curvature, uh, the mean curvature at the point. Uh, we have a nonlinear term phi here, which I'll describe in a minute. And again, as expected, we subtract off some non-local term, which again represents a volume preservation. Okay. So phi is, for us, the nonlinear term, which we can think of as being analogous to the red terms from our coupled equation. Okay. It turns out that the, to compute phi is a sort of a uh, difficult process. We begin by understanding phi as some sort of volumes, weighted volume average of psi, where psi satisfies this differential equation. And this differential equation is a first order approximation of the actin polymerization. Okay? So this is how we can understand it. Uh, so this is a very physical force. This is our driving force now. Because it'll become very important in a few minutes, I'm going to say uh, we should pay attention closely to this beta. Beta is a physical parameter which represents the actin polymerization rate in the model. It was, of course, evident, or it was uh, here in equation one as well. And so what we'll try and understand is how the uh, model changes and how the interface dynamics vary as we change the value of beta. Okay. So to motivate this, from equation two, if we take the nonlinearity to the left-hand side and we consider the equation v minus beta phi, of course, everything left on the right-hand side is now a constant okay, in terms of v. And so we can consider what happens to uh, the graph v minus beta phi as we vary b, beta. And it turns out for small values of beta, this is a small perturbation of the identity, and this will still be a monotone function. 
However, for sufficiently large beta, we lose monotonicity, which means we lose uniqueness in terms of the solving the equation v minus beta phi equaling a constant. What does this imply for us? Well, this is an interesting observation because uh, if we have non-monotonicity and non-uniqueness in this equation, it could mean that we have non-uniqueness of the velocity profile in our curve. So we can have non-unique solutions to the curve propagation in our, in our model. Okay? This could give rise, for example, to shock waves in the velocity profile, which also could be seen as some sort of ruffling or interesting uh, physical behavior, which uh, has yet to be seen. Okay? So uh, let me just say a good place to start then, I suppose, is with beta equal to zero. Okay? This is, of course, the first step. And if you think about the equation that we would have, well, it turns out that the nonlinearity vanishes completely, and we're left with the classic Allen Kahn equation. So if we have the Allen Kahn equation, it's already, uh, this is, of course, a scalar time independent, or time dependent version of the Ginzburg Landau equation. And so this is something that's perhaps more familiar to this audience. And it's already well understood the interface dynamics of uh, this single equation. Uh, and in this case, we get something which is just curvature motion. Okay, so each point propagates by uh, the curvature at the point. Okay. So mean curvature flow is already well understood uh, by both geometers and PDE specialists. Uh, and for your reference, here's a, a movie of what it would look like. So starting with any initial profile, uh, we'll shrink to a, a circle. And in this case, I used volume preservation. Uh, I, I, I added the constraint of volume preservation so we can see the long-term behavior a bit more clearly. Uh, we see that this curve just tends to a perfect circle and then reaches a stationary state there. Okay. And there's much theory that's been developed uh, to understand these dynamics. Okay. So in our case, when we have a non-zero beta, we have two sides of the question, two questions, or two areas of questions that we want to study. First of all, numerically, we want to at least have some evidence to help us form uh, some intuition for what should happen. So, of course, we want to solve this velocity equation for various values of beta, and particularly for large values of beta, where we expect, you know, this non-monotonicity to take over and the non-linear term to really starting to dominate the uh, interface dynamics. So, in this case, uh, we're hoping to observe some sort of non-uniqueness, for example, of the solution for large beta, which also could be very interesting for us to, to see. On the analytical side, we'd like to study this equation and see if we can prove some sort of existence, uniqueness, and smoothness properties for this, uh, for this equation. Of course, for small values of beta, it's very highly expected, both physically and intuitively, right? I mean, if there's very little actin, and as well as, as a perturbation of the Allen Kahn equation, this should have uh, motion which is very similar to curvature motion for sufficiently small beta. Okay. All the same, proving this is uh, very non-trivial, as it turns out, because classical methods used to show uh, long-term uh, existence and stationary solutions of this equation are no longer valid. Further, uh, we'd like to be able to see if we can observe stationary solutions for large beta which are not circles. Of course, this is sort of the ultimate goal because we're trying to, rem remember, we're trying to model how a cell moves. And so, as you remember the movies of a cell, they don't form circles but rather have a sort of a moon shape, if you will. And so we're hoping that uh, we can find evidence of such a behavior in this model. And in fact, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, we do have some very uh, nice evidence of this so far. Okay. So with uh, my few remaining minutes, I just want to show you a little bit about how the numerics were completed, uh, both in the regime of small beta and for large beta, and sort of give you the flavor of where the difficulties arose uh, in this uh, numerical approach. So uh, we'll be motivated by the work of uh, Leah Bronsard and uh, Wetton, uh, where we first want to model, in order to solve the nonlinear equation, we first have to be able to solve the linear equation. Okay. So first, we'll try and simulate the normal velocity moving via volume, uh, volume, preser uh, volume preserving mean curvature motion. Okay. In order to do this, we'll use a central difference approximation to first calculate the normal velocity equaling to kappa, okay, the curvature. Now to do this, we'll use a, uh, this discretization, but you'll note that there's no restriction in this case to movement in the normal direction. And this will become very important to us in a few minutes when we have to compare this with a, a, new, a new model for large, a new simulation for larger beta. But in this case, uh, it's okay to have tangential acceleration 
because any acceleration in the tangential direction simply amounts to a reparameterization of our curve and thus wouldn't affect at all qualitatively how our car curve would propagate in time. Okay? So, I mean, of course, if we had something that is parameterized via uh, arc length, then this wouldn't be an issue at all, but even in the case that we have something parameterized by some other parameterization, this is not a big deal. Okay? So once we compute the curvature term, we must compute this non-local term. So in order to compute the non-local term, we'll use trapezoid rules uh, to compute both the length of the curve as well as the, uh, the integral of kappa, so the, if you will, average curvature. <coughs> so I just want to make a note here uh, that it's well known already that given a simple closed curve, the integral of kappa ds is simply 2 pi. Uh, I mean, this is by the theorem of turning tangents. However, it's still important for us numerically to compute the, uh, the integral using this, um, using this trapezoid rule due to the fact that we're going to have some numerical error in both directions. And so in order to really maintain volume preservation, we want to make sure that uh, we use the same method to compute both, cur both curvature and its average. Okay. So once we've computed the linear term, this is only half the battle, of course. So in this case, where we're in the regime of small beta, what we'll want to do is use an iteration method motivated by this idea of perturbation theory where uh, the small perturbation will eventually, uh, will, our iteration will eventually converge due to the linearity dominating. Okay. So as a first approximation, of course, we take the linear part and then add uh, our nonlinearity with a guess, our first initial guess of the nonlinearity evaluated at the initial uh, guess and, and so on and so forth, right? This very classic iteration method. And of course, it can be shown that uh, we have convergence uh, of this numeric scheme for sufficiently small beta. Now, I must make a really important point here that this beta, the sense of smallness that I'm talking about here is not necessarily the same sense of smallness that I meant when we talked about the monotone versus non-monotone graphs. Okay? The monotone versus non-monotonicity, I mean, this subcritical and supercritical beta, this is a theoretical result, whereas... Here, I talk about beta being small or large is the necessary condition for the iteration method to converge, right? And this is very extremely dependent on the iteration scheme that I choose and the numerics that I choose. So there's no reason to believe that this beta is the same as the other one in terms of the regime in which it's valid, okay? And so, uh, finally, let me take one minute to show the numeric scheme for large beta. Uh, in this case, of course, an iteration scheme will no longer be valid. In this case, we'll use something more complicated, a Newton's method, or a slightly modified Newton's method, to be exact. But in this case, we again want to solve the normal velocity equation. Uh, we'll again compute uh, the curvature and the average curvature in similar ways. In this case, though, we're now solving a scalar equation, of course, and so we can't consider solving the curvature term as a vector quantity. We must solve it as a, the exact normal direction quantity. And so we'll convert, uh, we'll calculate kappa in this following way, which is a very standard result, as this cross product. And then we'll use Newton's method instead to solve this nonlinear equation. So, for example, if I discretize my curve into n, uh, into n points, I must solve this uh, nonlinear equation in n dimensional space using Newton's method. Okay? So, a much more complicated uh, method to use, and it converges slightly slower than, of course, the iteration method but this is going to be more globally relevant and will work for larger values of beta, uh, which will hopefully be sufficient for us to capture uh, the non-trivial behavior then. So as promised, I'll end then with a, uh, a few movies that show what happens in each of these regimes. So in the case of small beta, as is expected, we have what is essentially curvature motion. I mean, it's identically curvature motion. This is exactly expected, and currently the analysis is being done to try and prove, that, prove this uh, evolution equation uh, or this uh, long-term asymptotic behavior uh, rigorously. Okay. In the case of large beta, we have the following prelimin preliminary, oops, sorry, preliminary result. Here, you see that we have a, a same initial condition, which no longer converges to a circle, but rather... Uh, asymmetry persists in our curve. You can see it's slightly longer than it is uh, wide and it appears to have different curvatures throughout the entire curve. Uh, 
And if you are watching, you see that it actually does create some right propagation, which is very encouraging results from our model. And so I think that is all the time I have. So thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. Thank you. Remarks? Questions? Is the result that, that, that for the small values of beta, you didn't get it to move? You didn't get to your motion, but for the large values?